Nice number. Thank you, and welcome to all of you. Now, our board members. Our board members have held us together during this 18 months that we were unable to meet. Everybody's been working hard, they've been doing their jobs, they meet our, our board meetings have been via Zoom. And um, I just want to recognize them all. Now, please stand up. You don't have to keep standing up. I know nobody wants to stand up. <laughs> But just stand up when I call your name and then sit down when I uh, call the next person. And everybody, please hold your applause till the end. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming there will be applause. <laughs> okay, Kate Borduas is our newest board member. <laughs> She's our uh, representative to the F FNPS Council of Chapters, and she is a walk leader. Gail Finney. I don't see Dale today. She is our newsletter chair, and uh, she puts out our newsletter each month faithfully. Dave Manley, website manager and historian. Marianne Owen, secretary and hospitality chair. Bobby Rogers, chair of the grant committee as well as education and policy. Barb Siebel, Point Survey Chair and Website Calendar Manager. <laughs> Linda Wilson, Trigger. And Ruth Ward, Program and Publicity Chair. She has an announcement. Okay, so everybody should have gotten the email that Linda sent out a couple days ago. Or maybe uh, Lois sent it out, I guess. It's about the current propagation workshop. We've got two scheduled so far. Um, and we can schedule as many as we need, depending on when people are available and when people want to need to do this. We're going to do it right down here in the garden, six people at a time maximum, two people minimum, eight, um, plus myself. And uh, it's going to be really fun. So we'll go over different types of propagation. It will be hands on, so we'll learn how to do softwood cuttings, hardwood cuttings, um, air layering, potentially air layering. Um, and just regular old cuttings, division, all sorts of ways you can uh, make more plants. Um, so I'm going to send this around. Second row has already gotten it, so I'll send it down first. If you have a date in mind that you'd like to see this given, then just write it down there somewhere so that I know, or I'll send you an email. And my email address is on that announcement that Paul sent out the other day. So I'll send this one. Is these are both morning, morning. but if you want an afternoon session or if there's a specific day that works better for you, then just write it down as a suggestion and we'll probably find some other people to join them. Okay, Mary Ann also had a question she wanted to ask. We used to have refractors, which was punch that I made up from juice and so forth, and homemade goodies. Is anyone in favor of doing that again? Or <laughs> it was suggested to me to buy some kind of a snack that was wrapped, but that's going to get expensive. I don't think you're going to find cheap snacks. So, hands for um, going back to having punch and homemade goodies. No, okay. If I could say maybe after the pandemic is more over, you know. Well, I could get my cookies or stuff from the store mm -hmm. rather than making something myself. How many would be in favor of that kind of a snack? Uh, I think if, because there's not that many that are in favor of it, that will just let them slide for a few months and she helps them go. Okay, these are our agenda. Uh, somehow we didn't tell people to pick them up, so take one, pass it around. This is just what's going on today. If things go wrong. <laughs> okay. We got an award last year. 
We got an award for outstanding chapter in the state of Florida. All of us are amazed, surprised, shocked, stunned, and uh, puzzled. <laughs> like, what on earth did we do? To, you know, it's not something we applied for. No, it's back there on the table. It's a nice plaque. And when we were trying to figure out exactly how we got that, we finally decided that it was just a joint effort of all of our board members and everybody who worked so hard. For example, our president, Lois, held us all together with constant attention and informative emails, including frequent reinforcing COVID rules and guidelines. Gail Finney continued to assemble and distribute our colorful professional newsletter each month, the Mangrove Messenger, which I hope you all read. And she was supported by members who wrote interesting articles and sent beautiful photos. Anne Richter founded and administered our chapter Facebook page, which has grown to over 130 members. Kate Bordewis and Bill Duncan continued to have guided walks and field trips to local parks and environmental lands throughout the pandemic, keeping in mind all the COVID regulations. Dave Manley soldiered through a state-sponsored transition to a new website platform and added dozens of improvements. Barb Siegel continued with plant surveys, never missing a month in the 10 years she has been recorded site. I think that's amazing. Our garden keepers continue to tend and maintain our demonstration garden. And finally, for our annual conference, State asked each of our 35 chapters to develop a video about our chapter. And of course, I'm thinking, not me. <laughs> our program chair, Ruth Moore, designed and put together an outstanding video that really made us shine. It's short, only about five minutes, and we'd like to show it to you now. I'm here to introduce you to the Mangrove Chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. My name is Ruth Ward. I am the current program chair, and I will be narrating our presentation. Our current president is Lois Cantwell. The Mangrove Chapter supports the Florida Native Plant Society's mission by educating members and the general public about the value of native plants through conferences, workshops, local meetings, and publications. We restore and conserve native plant communities and participate in land management activities to enhance native plant habitats, and we encourage local landscape practices that preserve Florida's native plant heritage. Our primary service area includes South Sarasota County and Charlotte County, but we do welcome residents of other counties and states to our chapter. Our program speaker meetings are held at Lemon Bay Park in Englewood, Florida. Our chapter sponsors a native plant demonstration garden at a local environmental park as an example for visitors to learn about our Florida native plants and plant communities. Very often, our activities and workdays are in cooperation with the Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center. Other activities include community events and outreach, including participation in local environmental festivals and partnering with other groups to educate the general public on topics related to conservation and protection of our natural resources. Native plant sales are a way that we raise funds for our chapter. Other activities include design consultations and assisting in planning gardens with native plants and garden tours for members. A very popular activity, especially over the last year, are the walks that are led by volunteers at local environmental parks for members and non-members. The Mangrove Chapter manages a grant program which assists in funding local native planting projects in the community. Members often volunteer at local environmental parks and preserves. The Mangrove Chapter maintains a Facebook page for members and non-members. Plant inventories are used as educational tools on our field trips, and plant surveys are performed as part of an ongoing phenology study at a local environmental park. 
In the spring, our group sponsors an annual Plant Native Day with speakers, hikes, and plant sales. Regardless of where you live, we invite you to join us by becoming a member of the Mangrove Chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. The best benefit is knowing you are helping to protect Florida native plants and contributing to the long-term viability of our native plants and native plant communities. Our organization supports the science-based conservation of our floral heritage and of the wildlife species that depend on it. Contact our membership chair, Linda Manley, if you'd like information on becoming a member. Thank you for watching this presentation. Please see our website for complete information about our chapter, our activities, and our mission. Thank you, Bruce, for that. Thank you to all of our board members. It has just been wonderful for the last year, even though we couldn't meet. And now we pause for a commercial message. Okay, everybody has commercials, right? You might know, notice that when I was going to the board members, bottom had two titles, like web manager and historian, like program and publicity, like uh, environment and, um, I'm sorry. And anyway, we, we have way too many double responsibilities and we would like to change that. If you've been reading your Mangrove Messenger, you might have been following the Adventures of the Natives, where Rusty Lyonia and his buddies, mm -hmm. and uh, Laura Wolf and her gal pals have been discussing how each of them could help the Mangrove chapter. We need you to do this too. We'd like for our officers and committees to only have just one responsibility. Now, you do not have to be a plant expert, I promise. All you need to do is care about the earth. Um, you don't have to dedicate your whole life to mangrove. A lot of our positions require only one or two hours a month. A lot of our positions uh, can be done from your home, just at your own convenience. A lot of the positions can be done as a snowbird. Lois has been a snowbird, and she's been our president for seven years. So everything is possible. Donna Bailey bottom of that green agenda that I just hand out, there is a space where you can check things that you would like to do, how you would like to help us. We'd love to have you all fill out one of those, and you can give it to me, you can give it to Mary Ann, you can leave it on the table, you can leave it on your chair, I promise we will find it wherever you leave it. But I'd love to bring back, you know, 25 or so of those uh, when you leave. Now, on with the show, let me introduce Gerald Thompson, our newest macro chapter member and the environmental program coordinator here at Tech. I'll let him fill you in on the rest of his background. Right. Thank you, Gerald. All right, thank you for having me here. Like she said, I just joined last week, so I'm pretty excited to be here for my first meeting and to play such an important part I'm going to do around this. Um, but I work here at Cedar Point Park. Uh, I work for Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center. So we're a local nonprofit that runs education and environmental programs. Our main property is down in Punta Gorda. It's called Alligator Creek. <laughs> This is our secondary property. Uh, right now, I'm the only employee here, which means a lot of the volunteers with this organization have been a huge help in so many facets <laughs> of this position. But the good news is we did just hire a part-timer, so he'll be starting next week, and he'll be right there. So very excited, and hopefully he'll uh, follow my suit, and after 10 months of working here, he'll join too. <laughs> so, uh, how many have never been to this park before? Okay, so a good number, welcome. Uh, the park is about 115 acres, bigger than it looks from the road. We're mostly pine flatwoods, like you see out this window. And then uh, there is a pretty good portion of tidal mangrove swamp, uh, especially back along the Jeep trail is a really good spot to see those. And then we have small pockets of scrub habitat too. 
So I'll talk a little bit more about the park and myself as we keep going. All right, so my background is how I got here. I'm born and raised in Sarasota. My parents still live in Sarasota. Right now I just live just up the road from here. But I'm um, local boy. Uh, I started working at Mo Moraine as a high school intern. And then uh, I went and studied at Nova Southeastern University. It's on the other side of the state in Fort Lauderdale. And what I studied there was I uh, graduated with my bachelor's in marine biology, and then I also got my minor in writing, of all things. Mm -hmm. But while I was there at school, uh, they actually had a really cool program where one of my professors was good friends with Dr. Marty Main from University of Florida, who started the Florida Master Naturalist Program. And we were able to get an entire college course designed around becoming a Florida Master Naturalist. Before then, I thought plants were cool, fun to look at, didn't know much about them, but liked them as much as the next guy, and that was like a crash course in the, here's everything you need to know about plants, and here's how you can never go anywhere without noticing an invasive plant again. <laughs> so, yeah, my school was in Fort Lauderdale, and our unofficial school mascot was the giant iguana that lived out by the ponds. His name was Iggy. Uh, he got dethroned my senior year by a bigger iguana named Ignacio. And uh, I was actually way up high in the tree and got to watch that battle do it. <laughs> and then uh, while I was in college, I started actually working for Moat. So I started there as a high school intern, but I worked for them down in the Keys. They have a coral research facility down there, and I was leading summer camps. So for a college kid, you couldn't ask for a more perfect job. I was getting paid to live in the Keys and take kids out diving on the reef. I got to go every two weeks to dry tortugas. I got to help with coral planting. And now that I know my plants, I really want to get down there more and see all the cool island plants living down there. But this coral that I'm diving with here, that is called pillar coral, and that is critically endangered. Uh, it's actually very close to going extinct in the state of Florida. So I like to say pillar coral is my favorite animal, and I was really lucky to get to see it working in that job there. And then most recently before this job, I worked with something a little smaller, uh, I worked at a job up in Yulee, right on the Florida-Georgia border, on a program breeding this bird right here. This is the Florida grasshopper sparrow. This is the most endangered bird in all of North America. So uh, they live in Florida dry prairie, which is an open grassland in Florida. Very few trees, it burns every one to two years, and they've got very specific habitat requirements. There's only three areas in Florida where they still survive. And there were less than 80 left. Uh, this has been the third year of the breeding program. I was there last year for the second. But only 80 left in each of the last three years. This program has released more than 100 back into the wild. The problem is even massive success. Still, so most of them are going to die or get eaten or something. But last I read, numbers are back around 125. So the population is growing again. Um, I did get to go out to that Florida dry prairie. And it was pretty incredible seeing something like that. You know, kind of a forgotten piece of Florida. They say about 99% of that Florida dry prairie is forgotten. And we do have some of it near us. Uh, Mayaka State Park has excellent examples of Florida dry prairie. So, but you can see virtually no trees out there. Like I said, it burns every one to two years. So it's remarkable with that type of requirement that these birds even exist anymore. And then while I was working with these little tiny... That is from Three Lakes uh, Wilderness Management Area. It's in Kissimmee. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. And so uh, while I was working with these little tiny birds that they even weigh an ounce, everyone else at the facility I worked at, it's called White Oak Conservation, uh, were breeding other endangered species, and theirs were a lot bigger. They had tigers and cheetahs. I looked out my window and saw white rhinos. And uh, probably my favorite day was when I got to volunteer with uh, the rhino department. This was a baby black rhino that was born there, so that was pretty exciting. I don't know if it's uh, so ugly that it turns in the queue or vice versa, but it's definitely somewhere on that spectrum. You can see the mama right back there. She wasn't too happy that we wanted to pet him, but she, she got over it when she got food. All right, and I wanted to talk about some of the plants up there because my favorite jobs while I was working up at White Oak were one, going out with a big butterfly net and catching grasshoppers to feed the sparrows. And then on my free time, once they learned that I liked plants, 
they sent me out harvesting seeds to start a, a native plant garden there. I left in October of last year. That was when my internship ended. I'm hoping somebody is still taking care of my garden up there for me. But they had some really incredible plants that I wanted to, to share with you, all the way from North Florida. So they had some really beautiful orchids. This was growing right outside the rhino enclosure. This is a uh, mini flowered grass pink. It's a type of ground orchid that was just growing on kind of a drainage ditch next to the dirt road they have there. And it's really cool. It's, um, its pollination technique is unique. It looks like the pollen is up here on the top part of the orchid, but it's a decoy. It gets large, heavy body, especially bumblebees to land on. And then that top petal has a, a hinge. When the bee lands on it, it drops down and drops them onto this kind of boat-shaped petal, and that's where all the pollen is. Uh -huh. So it seems very convoluted and complicated, and it is, but it's really fascinating. They had other very cool orchids. This is a crusted horned bog orchid, and this was growing out all the way near the entrance, again near the side of the road. It was really remarkable to me how many amazing plants were just growing on the side of the road. And so this one was really incredible. They only bloomed for about two weeks and then they were off on the wayside, but they were very, very beautiful. One of my favorites that grew by the sparrow pens was pineland hibiscus. And the reason I like them is because they were a favorite hangout of the green link spiders. Since I was going around collecting seeds from so many flowering plants, I got to see a lot of those green link spiders and they became my favorite. I fell in love with them. If you're unfamiliar, they like to hide inside of flowers, and then when a bee or a fly or a butterfly or anything lands on that flower to pollinate it, they pounce and eat that insect. <laughs> so they're just really cool animals, and I, I really fall in love with them a lot. Uh, they, so the area up there has some amazing longleaf forests that they frequently burn, so very healthy. Um, lots of unique plants there that we should be seeing in other parts of Florida could be seen pretty easily there. So it was up there that I saw my first pine lily blooming out there that you know only grow in areas that have been burned in the proper way. And so they had you know fields of them. It was gorgeous out there. Uh, I the day I got there they had a prescribed burn in the forest and so I got to see everything come back as I was there. One of my favorites was toothache grass, one we don't have this far in south, but it has this really amazing curly hue seed head on it. And I thought these were the coolest plants, so I have probably 100 pictures in my phone, just look at the shape of that one. And that one's probably my favorite, because it has a double, almost like DNA, double helix on it. But my absolute favorite, as a special place in my heart, are carnivorous plants. And they had some really cool carnivorous plants up there. This next picture is my favorite selfie I've ever taken. So this is was out in the prairie where I was catching grasshoppers. This is a hooded pitcher plant, and of course that's me, that's the hatted catcher plant. But it was pretty incredible. They had probably about an 80 acre field that just had big patches of pitcher plants like that just dotted all around. Incredible wildflowers, there were turkey and deer and coyotes running all around me when I was catching the grasshoppers. It was a really cool, special place to be that I'm sure you all, being plant fans, would also appreciate as much as I do. So a little bit about Cedar Point now. So this building that we're in, uh, a lot of it is brand new. So last year, around March, uh, there began a remodeling project. Last March was kind of the perfect time to start remodeling because the world ended. <laughs> and so it was a really good time to close the building. And so what you see in here is brand new wood floors. These windows behind us are brand new. They used to be sliding glass doors. Those shelves built around the windows are only a couple months old now. This wall and TV I'm standing in front of are brand new. New paint job, a lot of it's brand new. So Bobby had my position for a long, long time before I did, and uh, she can probably tell you just how incredibly different it looks now than what it used to look like. So. And then I came on. I can't take too much credit for the remodel. I was hired in January, and then I started here at the park toward the end of February. So the remodel was basically done by the time I got here, but it was 
bare walls with nothing on display. So I've had a lot of fun kind of putting these displays together and it's still absolutely a work in progress. Uh, we still have plenty of open room where we could put out more displays. And uh, Charlotte County, the, you know, this is County Park, they have committed to investing over $100,000 just to remodeling this building for future projects in addition to what's already here. So every time you guys come back, there's going to be something new and exciting going on inside here. Exactly like what I was saying, it's still a work in progress and still uh, adding to it. And then one exciting thing that we have in the park that is starting as of about a month and a half ago is our bald eagles are back. And so their season officially began uh, last month. If you go behind the building, there's a kiosk back there. You're going to turn right on the Gopher Taurus Trail. If you keep following that, eventually you'll hit yellow chains that stop you. That's where the eagle nest is. So if you take that trail, we have scopes set up to help you find the nest. Now these guys are kind of being a little weird. They're not on the nest consistently yet. They're there early in the morning, late in the day, but I've been calling them mating adjacent. They're hanging out together. They're flying together a lot. I don't think they've really started laying in the nest yet, but give it another month and they'll probably be on the nest a lot more to where you'll be able to see them on that nest pretty reliably. Um, just driving home one day, I saw one just hanging out in the retention pond on the side of the road. So they're around the nest, they're in the area, they're just all over the place still right now. Last year, they did have one female chick, that's her, and uh, she stayed around for a long time. She stayed until almost June before she finally uh, fledged and went off. So she'll take about five years to mature, grow that uh, white head, and then she'll come back to somewhere in the local area again. So they go and kind of wander, they're teenage years, and then once they hit maturity, they come back to the same general area that they were born in. We just had a really big event in the park that was very exciting. It was our haunted Halloween festival. <laughs> and so, were any of you able to come to this? Okay, well, it was a lot of fun, also a lot of very hard work. <laughs> Uh, we had live animals on display up here, we had a haunted trail, we had food trucks here, we had crafts for the kids, pumpkins for sale, all sorts of stuff going on. It ended up being a big family affair too. Uh, my mom came and helped run the craft table, my dad was the chainsaw man on the haunted type. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun to put together. We were planning this, we talked to other organizations that have done Halloween events. We were expecting we'd get a few dozen maybe 50 people a night. We had over 100 every night. Uh, for the whole event total, all four nights combined, we had over 600 people. A lot of the people had never been to the park before, and it ended up being a nonprofit. It was a really great fundraiser for us. So the event was a huge success. First time we've done it. Can't wait to have it again next year. Uh, a new, new-ish program we have going on again. Uh, with COVID, we have the Sideline or Kayak programs. But our kayaks are up and out of again. They're back out on the water. So we partnered with a new company based up in Sarasota called Biotica, and they're leading kayak tours for us again. So if any of you are kayaking fans, the tour is really, really great. So you'll have two guides with you, one in the front and one uh, sweeping in the back. And you'll start in Oyster Creek, and you'll paddle up. You'll explore the mangroves, the oyster bars, really good way to see birds. They even go to a wading bird rookery. And then you'll get out into Lemon Bay where you can see sharks, dolphins, sea turtles, all sorts of really cool things like that. Uh, you'll take a little pit stop on the beach at the back side of the park, maybe look for neat shells or just relax in the shade. And then you'll come back and you'll be done with the tour. So it's a really great, well-rounded tour to see a little bit of everything in the area. And then another one of our new programs, you might be familiar, we have seagrass wading trips here. And those are very fun. Go see a different plant that you might not think of when you're gardening, seagrass being a plant, but it's really great to explore out there. But we've been doing those for a long time. One of the new ones we're doing are nighttime seagrass trips, where you can come. We start about an hour before sunset, and we'll get out to the water right at about when the sun is setting. That way you can see the sunset over the water. It's really beautiful, but really it's so you can get more comfortable before you get into the water. We don't want to be pitch dark and then just say, Get in. <laughs> so uh, you'll start, you'll get accustomed while the sun's still out, and as the sun's going down, you can see some of the crepuscular and nocturnal animals coming out. And so you see we're all wearing green headlights. We have specialized 
lighting situation that we use for these. Uh, we tried it when we were doing a trial run of bright white LED headlights and the fish and everything were getting super stressed out. So we went to green headlights and it gives it a nice spooky feel, but green penetrates the water really well without being as harsh as the white LED. And we also have red glow sticks in the buckets. Most sea life can't see the color red. It's the first color that gets filtered out in water. So between the green headlamps to make it more visible to us and the red glow sticks to make them more visible in the bucket, this shirt is really good. It's, you know, no more stress on the animals than being out there during the day. So I think this program is probably my favorite new program that we're doing. We do have one coming up on the 19th. So it's at 445. So that's next Friday, I believe. You will meet right here, right in this building. And then, so when they asked me to do this meeting, I was trying to think of a theme that I could talk to you all about that not everybody has heard before. There are a lot of people in this room way smarter than I am. And so I wanted to think of something maybe that not everybody has heard everything about already. So I wanted to talk about that little building off in the corner of the parking lot. It's called the Cookie House. And so the Cookie House is a really unique building and it's really special that we have it here on property. So it is the only remaining building of an old marine lab that was here in Englewood. It was called the Bass Biological Laboratory. If you're familiar, just up the road, there's that Publix shopping center with the Publix and the Office Depot. Uh, that's where the property used to be. That and the road right next to it, that was all the property of the lab. Since that got developed, uh, they, most of those buildings were demolished, but they did save one building, the Cookie House, and relocated it here to this park in 2006. And that was a pretty big endeavor. It was mostly funded uh, by the construction company. They pocketed, or they took on a lot of the cost of transporting it. Even with that, it still cost the county $60,000 to relocate it. So it was a pretty big expenditure to move it here. And uh, the lab was founded in 1931 by John Foster Bass Jr. And this building that we have here, this was his personal office and laboratory. So it was kind of like uh, the boss's office on the property. So here's a picture of getting it loaded onto the tractor and moving it. It had an entire police escort and everything. And so it, it's really amazing that we have it here still preserved today. Um, you might notice one part of the building I haven't filled out yet is the shelf over here. I've been in touch with uh, one of the descendants, John Faster Bats IV, which if you live in Englewood, you might know the name. He's a local photographer. He still has a lot of those original artifacts from the lab, as does Moat. Moat has a lot of them too, Moat Marine does. And we're hoping to make this entire shelf a, an exhibit dedicated just to the history of the lab and to Cookie House. Also, maybe possibly get Plant Society involved. Uh, they just had a really beautiful sidewalk out there, and we're hoping maybe spruce it up and add some really cool native plants out there as well. But I just wanted to share a couple uh, pictures and history about the lab. That's what it looked like when they were building it. So this is John here and his wife, Elsie. And this building is really unique. It is the only building of this construction type in the entire state of Florida. So John was from Chicago, and when he moved down here, he used building styles that he was more familiar with from the Midwest. Even in the Midwest, this is still a pretty uncommon building style. So no one's really sure why he did this. This was the only building on the property that he built like this, but for whatever reason, he decided to build it like this. So what he did is he cut pine logs into thin slabs, and he laid them standing upright like a coin standing on its edge, and set them into cement. And the cement was both a mixture of uh, concrete and sand that he dredged up from Women Bay. And so it's very, <laughs> A locally sourced building out there. The pine trees that he cut were from his other home right up around the corner on San Casa. So uh, it's just a very unique building style and like I said the only building type of its kind in the state. And it's called Cookie House because residents thought that the wood slats it looked like brown cookies on a white plate so that's what they nicknamed it. And the wood is still in remarkably good shape. If you go out and look at it after this meeting, you can still see the bark is still preserved on some of those old pine logs. So it really is a remarkable feat of unique architecture. 
Uh, that's what it looks like on the property of the back sign. And so it wasn't just a laboratory, it was like a whole community. So they had an orange grove, they had an apiary where they raised the bees, uh, they had uh, employees' quarters, they had a boathouse, um, they had a main laboratory, and several other buildings. Uh, they also had a uh, windmill and a water tower, so it was really a sprawling property, almost like a small little town. And this is what the inside of the house looked like. And uh, beginning in January, the county will do open house tours of it. And what's really cool about this picture is the paper towel rack and the sponge holder right there are both still in the building. Mm -hmm. So like I said, the building was built in about 1931. So about 90 years old, and you still got the sponge rack sitting in there. Mm -hmm. Don't know how it survived, but it did. It's pretty remarkable. And the lab was important because it had a lot of firsts in the state of Florida. Um, that's also just a good picture to see the wire tower and windmill. But the lab was Florida's very first uh, full-time marine science lab. The next closest one was all the way up in North Carolina. So it was really the first full-time marine lab in the South at all. And they picked Anglewood because it was really close to lots of different habitats that they could sample, close to the Gulf, close to the Bay, had several freshwater creeks that they could explore. So it was really a perfect spot, and Anglewood had very few people back then. So it was still kind of a pristine area in the 1930s when they picked this location. Uh, there was a lab down in Dry Tortugas, but that was only there in the winter. Uh, they didn't stay down year-round. This was the first one that stayed full-time year-round. They were also the first non-government owned lab in the state of Florida. And they were the first co-ed research center in the state of Florida. They were open to just about anybody that wanted to come, man, woman, um, just about any background you can think of, they were welcomed at the best level. And so it had a pretty remarkable history. It's like I said, it was open to really anyone that wanted to come use the lab. As long as you wrote a letter to Mr. Bass and said, why you want to use the lab and how it would benefit you or benefit your researcher, he pretty much let you come and do whatever you needed to do. Uh, he did charge you a dollar a day to use the lab and then a dollar a day to live on the property. I'd love to spend a dollar a day living in with him. Uh, one unique thing he did was he also asked the residents to write a poem about their stay. And in most archives, they have a lot of those poems that people wrote about their stay in Florida. So you can hear about, you know, the mosquitoes and how bad they were, or, you know, sitting around with the other scientists around the campfire, or going out fishing for sharks in the middle of the Gulf and, you know, middle of the night. So there's some really amazing poems written by the scientists here. And then they also were an important part of the community. So they frequently had uh, residents coming for parties, um, campfires, they had school field trips just like this with a child probably eight years old holding a live octopus. Uh, and one of my favorites that they did that Mr. Bass has actually talked about was they had a huge Halloween party every year. And seeing some of their old Halloween yeah. costumes, <laughs> there's some pretty good pictures out there. So I believe that's actually Mr. Bass in uh, the shark costume. And so there were lots of famous scientists and naturalists that came through Bass Lab that were huge in the state of Florida and all over the country. So some prominent people that came through, uh, this was Mr. Bass himself. With, they had a pair of French bulldogs that lived on the property sleeping inside his shirt there. Uh, he began the lab in 1931, like I said. He unfortunately passed away in 1939. So he didn't get to see uh, the lab flourish for very long, uh, but he was a really important part of it. Without him, there would be no Bass Lab. Uh, also, his wife Elsie, after he died in 1939, she ran it for the next five years. So right after the Great Depression, the advent of World War II, she was running the property and running the lab. And at that point, it was more than just a lab. They were also supplying a research specimens. That was a big part of their business once you got past the research. They were supplying uh, taxidermy and dissection specimens. And so they made several really big breakthroughs that we still use today in providing specimens for dissection for medical students. And then, yeah, that's her with probably about a say four to 500 pound Goliath worker that she got. 
then the next is uh, Dr. Donald Zinn. He's the one that took most of these pictures, so I don't know if this ended up being a selfie or what, but really nice picture in front of the Cookie House smoking a pipe. And after Cookie House closed, uh, he went on to start his own medical practice up in Connecticut. So he became a radiologist after working at this marine lab. So it was a lot more than just marine research. There was a lot of medical information coming out of this lab as well. And then two of maybe the most famous names that worked there were Dr. Archie Carr and his wife Marjorie Harris Carr. They both worked together at the lab. So there's uh, Dr. Carr with a diamondback rattlesnake and Marjorie is holding an indigo snake there. Uh, they're both hugely important in Florida history. Uh, Archie Carr was a very prominent herpetologist studying reptiles. And on the other coast of Florida, near the Sebastian Inlet, there's the uh, Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge. And that was one of the first wildlife refuges set aside for conservation of a specific animal. It's set aside for nesting sea turtles. And he was a huge proponent in getting that land protected, and now it's named after her. Uh, Marjorie Harris Hart, her name might not be as well known, but she's still very important to Florida. She was a huge activist that stopped the Cross Florida Barge Canal. Uh, there is a plan to build a giant barge that would basically <laughs> bisect Florida in half. And can you imagine what Florida would be like if that went through? We would basically have the Panama Canal across the state. And so she was the biggest leader in getting that project stopped. Uh, they had already started digging out the canal. Now that land is a nature trail, and it's named the Marjorie Harris Carr uh, Greenway. So both very important, and both spent time in the Bass Lab, and I'm sure in the Cookie House over there. And then another very prominent scientist was Dr. Eugenie Clark. Uh, she might be more well known as the Shark Lady. And she uh, got her start helping with Bass Lab. Or not got her start, but she came through in Bass Lab. And she helped with a lot of the shark fishing and different uh, marine studies that were happening there, especially preparing uh, marine specimens for preservation. And so her name might be familiar because after the lab closed in 1944 with World War II, it just got too hard to keep the lab open. So the lab closed and uh, the Vanderbilt stepped in. They saw the importance of the lab and they uh, funded the Cape Hayes Marine Laboratory. So just down the road in Cape Hayes, uh, Eugene Clark was the first director of that lab. And that lab uh, became a really well-known shark research facility. This is one of the shark holding pools. And uh, there's a rumor at high tide, you can still get down to that property and kayak in the old shark pool that they had. Uh, but what's special about this building is it eventually moved up to Sarasota and became known as Moat Marine Laboratory. That's such a huge fixture in our community today and one of the most renowned marine labs in the world. So that little building that we have on our property was the beginning of what led to Moat Marine Lab. So it's really amazing history that we're so lucky to have preserved in our park. It's a really special part of Englewood that really belongs to everyone and we're Really glad to have it on display for everyone to see. Once that exhibit is uh, completed, it'll be even better to come see some of those research artifacts. All right, so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit more about the park since we're all plant nerds here. Uh, we want to know about the plants that are out there. And so what has been blooming, I know some of you might be snowbirds, and so you might be just getting back and you want to know about what's blooming out there right now. So if you were to go out and explore after this, what you would see. Uh, this first one, I'm going to kind of eat my words because you would not see this this time of year. But we have tar flower, and I'm putting that because, oh my gosh, it was a banner year for tar flower this year. I saw more tar flower this year than I've seen probably the rest of my life come by. So it was a really amazing year. Uh, I could even see them blooming on the side of the road, driving down Placida Road here. And so we did have a few populations of it here in the park, which was really good to see. If you're not familiar, tar flower. Uh, it's very sticky, that's how it gets its name. It's as sticky as commercial flypaper, but it's not carnivorous. It doesn't eat the insects that it attracts. So no one is really sure why it's sticky like that because it doesn't make sense. You're kind of killing the bugs coming to pollinate you. So it's still a mystery why they're so sticky like that, but they're a beautiful, unique flowering that we have here. Uh, one that's still out there, but it's mostly done at the moment is the lopsided Indian grass. If you walk right, like you're going to see the eagles, there's really great patches of it. 
um, along that first loop of the gopher tortoise trail. They've lost most of their flowers and seeds at this point, but you can still see the stems on there. And they get these really beautiful yellows and reds in the seeds and when they kind of flow back and forth in the breeze, it's really, really beautiful. And they're called lopsided Indian grass because the flowers only grow on one side of that central blade. So it, they're just a, another fascinating, unique, beautiful species that we have here in the park. Uh, one that is blooming, but kind of on the downturn, but you can still find some out there, is golden rock. Uh, golden rock is another very prominent fall wildflower in Florida, and uh, they're really great to see out here, very lucky to have them. And one that looks pretty similar, that is blooming like crazy if you walk down to the end of Jeep Trail right now, is yellow top. So there is lots of yellow top uh, blooming at the end of that trail. It's really beautiful if you get a chance to walk down there and see it all. Like I said, the end of Jeep Trail. Uh, one unique plant that we saw right around the Halloween festival is this giant orchid. That's a cell phone picture, so not as professional as the other one. Uh, but we had a couple out on the Jeep Trail. And so these are pretty large. It almost looks like two large palm fronds coming off of them. And then you get the central flower head. And uh, they're still blooming just a little bit. They're mostly in seeds at this point, but you can still see them out there along the Jeep Trail. So I've seen at least two out there, and they should still be out there. So pretty cool to see. Um, orchids have a special place in my heart, like I showed from North Florida. I started with two orchids. Florida has the highest diversity of orchids in North America. So if you're into orchids, you're in a good place for them. Uh, one that's also popping off right now that we're seeing a lot of is saltbush. So these are really beautiful plants that are just loaded down with flowers. Uh, the females have really pretty small white flowers, but to get the really pretty ones, you want to find the males because they have long, fuzzy, almost cotton-like flowers. It really looks like a giant, almost cotton tree when you find those folds. And then, not exactly flowering, but one I think is very cool, one of my favorites, is our state tree, the sable palm. We sure do have a lot of them out here, and they're starting to get a lot of berries on them. The berries are a really important food source for a lot of the migratory bird species coming through Florida that we're starting to see this time of year. <laughs> and uh, the berries to me are delicious. If you're into edible plants, can't recommend sable palm berries enough. They have a hard outer coating, but once you get into that, very tasty. To me, they taste a lot like grapes. Um, other people say dates, but very, very tasty. And I also recently learned about sable palm. So, you know, these berries used to be flowers, kind of late spring, early summer. Each one of those flower spikes can have over 80,000 flowers on it. Just this one tree, you see maybe five flower spikes coming off of it. That means you have one tree with hundreds of thousands of flowers on it. This is an incredibly important plant to pollinators. If you're looking for plants to add to your own landscaping, this one is a massively beneficial plant to have around. And then uh, last thing, just we, like I said, it's just myself here starting next week. I'll have a part-time, but I rely on a lot of help with volunteers. So I could definitely use help with several projects that we have going on. One very relevant to this organization is uh, the garden parties. So every Monday morning, I'm not sure if they've started just yet, but they'll be starting very soon. Uh, volunteers will be out working in the garden. So it can be something as small as trimming and weeding, it can be planting new plants, it can be potting some for meetings like this. But I'm sure they would definitely love more hands out there for the garden parties every Monday morning. Uh, we also have our maintenance parties, which don't sound as fun, but they do a lot of trail maintenance here. So without them, we really wouldn't have hikeable trails out here. And coming in the winter, if you're interested in invasive plant control, uh, the county comes in and works with our maintenance volunteers, and they do a lot of invasive plant removal in the park. So if that's something you're interested in, you want to come and get some exercise out on the trail, uh, they could absolutely use more help with that. Uh, we need more guided hikes leaders. If you want to flex your plant knowledge and just talk about the local habitats, we have seven other parks that we lead hikes at. And uh, some of you do lead hikes already. Uh, but we could always use more. If you want to get out there and either join or lead the hikes, that would be a huge help to us here. Uh, staffing events like Halloween. Like I said, I had to have my parents come. I had my uh, sister and brother-in-law drive all the way from North Brayton. Couldn't have done it without them. So I had lots of volunteers that came to help, but we could always use more to make those big events like that possible. 
So if you ever want to come and you want to be the ch chainsaw man out on the trail, we've we got a spot for you. All right, and then just working in the office. If being outdoors and the heat and the rain maybe isn't your thing, you could always use more help up here. So whether it's helping in the building, setting up, uh, helping set up displays or signage, doing computer work, um, could use a lot of help doing anything like that as well. If being in the AC is more your speed. <laughs> And there's plenty more. If there's anything you want to help with that you have an idea for, I'm not going to turn you away. So if you have a great idea that you want to lend a hand for, I'm all ears. And uh, that's it for me. So thank you for letting me come talk to you. And I'd be happy to take any questions or talk about the park more to anyone that wants to hear me speak more. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you know Janice and Jim Dupinel in Key Largo? I don't. They're the marine biologists at Penny Camp Park. Oh, very cool. Yeah, we uh, would take some of our summer campers to Penny Camp too. Um, we also did coral restoration in Key Largo, not at Penny Camp, but very close. Well, so we went out to some of their reefs sometimes and planted coral. And he's a botanist. I'd like to bring him here to have to the talk. Yeah, that would be great. Um, we are, you know, starting to plan a lecture series as well. So if anyone knows someone or you yourself would like to, you have an interesting topic that you'd like to speak about, again, I'm all ears. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. I was wondering about the grasshopper sparrow. Yes. Have you guys moved any to... The Oscar River State Park, or is that not really? No, right? no. So maybe they're too few to be able to. Yeah. So right now they're just trying to repopulate the areas that they live in. Um, there's Kissimmee, Kissimmee Prairie State Park. There's that Three Lakes uh, Wilderness Management Area, and then there's a private ranch where they live on too. Uh, but right now they're just trying to repopulate those areas. Uh, they used to live at Avon Park Air Force Range as well. So I'm guessing if they did start repopulating, that Air Force Range would probably be one of the first pla new places that they'd reintroduce them to. But I've been telling them we've got spots in my backyard that they should release really some in. So. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Just a few closing announcements. Number one, before you leave, Look around at all the exhibits. It's just, it's wonderful. He's got some cool stuff here. He's got a lot of uh, skeletons and stuff that he got from here and there and Wolverine and whatever. So look around. Also, don't leave before a plant raffle because your little red ticket might get you a plan. Beautiful gumbo limbo tree. Um, three things that we love to have you uh, join, pay attention to, read. That is our Facebook page. Join our Facebook page. If you just type Mangrove Chapter into your um, Facebook search blank, you'll come up with our chapter. A second thing, the Mangrove Messenger, our newsletter that you get every month. It's a wonderful newsletter. It's got all kinds of information in it. And go to our website. Um, the website also has information. Most of these places are going to have all of our walks, all of our meetings, um, any events, special events that we have, like Plant Native Day, and we will also have some walks and events from like-minded organizations. Other organizations who want to uh, protect wildlife, who want to preserve the uh, plants and preserve the land from development. <laughs> um, just pay attention to all these uh, publications that we have available because they're just chock full of information. Now, I think that's it. We're ready for the raffles, yes. Um, I would just like to throw out an addendum to Gerald um, to invite you to come on, on walks. When I give the walks for a native plant society, I'm here Saturday, maybe mostly Saturday. I've got some people saving my lives on a few Saturday. Uh, but we focus on walks, but also I believe walks for check, mostly on Tuesdays, most Tuesdays of the month. Um, and when we do those walks, we also focus on uh, native plants and, and particularly ecosystems. So it's just not identifying 
checking off species, but it's the interact uh, the interactions, the successful interactions of the entire community. So I invite you to join me uh, on those. I like some new faces. I keep telling the same story to the same people here and here. So I'd like to see some new faces. Uh, we always begin at nine o'clock in the parking lot. I don't see the list, Cheryl. But my first one is at Amberjack. My very favorite walk starts on the 16th, Tuesday the 16th. And we actually go mountaineering. We get 13 feet elevation gain, and we see a lot of difference in the landscape over those 13 feet. So I do invite you to join me. Are there any other board members? Oh, well, these guys, yeah, I've been, I've been Shamrock Park. Yeah. And if you can't make that Saturday one, I will sit in Shamrock Park on Friday to 12. I can't get enough of Shamrock Park. That's the county. So you're welcome to Shamrock on either the 12th or the 13th. Most all of our walks are on our website, so just go there. So on the new slide. Yeah, paint walks are on the website. Yeah, so uh, we've got our website too. It's checkflorida.org. Check the C A C C for Charlotte Harbor Environmentalism. So checkflorida.org, we go to our calendar, it has all of our events. If you're on Facebook, Cedar Point also has a Facebook page for we'll share all of our events. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Yeah. Along with the plants, I bought two books that might just sort of look like they're back here from the mansion. <laughs> Okay. But yeah. I want to go okay, good. There are books that are part of the raffle, and somebody brought a puzzle of really pretty flowers. So, um, anything else before we start the raffle? Okay. I want to just tell you that we have a book here that we like everyone to sign in at. Right. So, if you, so if you haven't signed the book and got the ticket, that is, I'm going to read the last three numbers of the ticket, and when you when you get the magic number, you can go through the point. Nine, five, and seven. Okay. Nine, five, and seven. Nine, six, four. The new code. One, four, eight. That's me.